Florida, 1990. A small group of executives have just left an emergency meeting with a top company advisor named Dr. Michael Kami. After assessing the company's figures, he advises the group to get new jobs and sell the company as soon as possible. And in amongst this executive group sits the company's 53-year-old CEO and founder, Yvon Chenard, who has a very different idea on what to do with the 18-year-old company. Chenard instead decides to invite his top 12 executives on a two-week excursion to the far reaches of the Americas, to Patagonia in southern Chile. This decision would be a vital turning point in the life of Yvonne Chenard, but this is not the first time he has ventured south. Welcome to Cervantium. It's 1968, a turbulent year across the globe. From Paris to Prague, protests rage. And while France quietly becomes the world's fifth nuclear power, Ho Chi Minh launches a major counteroffensive in Vietnam, turning the tide of the war in their favor. And these currents too reach the US with unprecedented force. Social unrest grips the country, culminating in racial tension and prolific assassinations, shaking the very establishment to its knees. And in Ventura, California, four young men are also staging their own kind of rebellion. Doug Tompkins, Chris Jones, Dick Dorworth, and a 29-year-old Yvonne Chenard are skiers, surfers, and Yosemite train climbers. And in September of 1968, the four men are packing up to commence a journey of a lifetime, a journey to the southern tip of South America. And what they discover there over the next six months is an untouched Eden of fjords and glaciers, gauchos and condors and jagged peaks, the immutable beauty that is Patagonia. A world, as Jannard says, of high winds, orange skies, lenticular clouds and blanched mountain tops. And it was from this very trip, together with his friend Doug Tompkins, that Yvonne Jannard would come back with a tremendous resolve, a fixed purpose and a profound sense of destiny. Doug Tompkins, on the one hand, would go on to set up the clothing companies, the North Face and Esprit, whilst Jannard, already a self-taught blacksmith, would focus on climbing equipment. With ingenuity and grit, he pushed back against the European approach to mountaineering, simplifying the equipment, making it lighter, stronger, and more functional, and setting in place a new era of sustainable climbing. Over the next decade, Jannard would expand the company, and what started out with equipment would soon become the mighty Patagonia, one of the leading sustainable clothing brands of the 21st century. Indeed, there was no foreseeable lull to this momentum, and during the 1980s, the company would see unprecedented success with 40% annual growth, as well as stark retail and international expansion. However, towards the end of the decade, their equipment arm, faced with legal challenges, was forced to file for bankruptcy, and Patagonia itself would soon hit the wall. So where did it all go wrong? According to Chenard, we made all the classic mistakes of a growing company. We failed to provide adequate training to new hires, and we mistakenly created eight autonomous product divisions with three channels of distribution, an unnecessarily complex structure that ultimately exceeded management's skills. And by the end of the 1980s, with the company restructured five times in five years, it was time to call in the experts. And so the group contacted Dr. Michael Carney, the corporate white knight and savior of Harley Davidson and the chief strategist to IBM. And so in late 1990, Chenard, together with his executive team, fly to Miami, Florida for an emergency meeting. After assessing their position, Dr. Kami advises them to fold, to sell their entire company and invest the proceeds into the stock market. And despite Chenard's misgivings, over time, Dr. Kami's prophecies start to become true, culminating in a Black Wednesday of 150 staff layoffs and a major plunge in the company's profits. And to make matters worse, the US enters a recession in 1991 and so demand plummets, and the banks begin to call in the loans. Chenard is now in a perilous position. In essence, Patagonia had exceeded its limits. They had become dependent on growth they could no longer sustain, and Chenard is left with a dilemma. Is it time to fold his 18-year-old company or push on and forge ahead? Chenard's solution is brazen and, as expected of him, rebellious in nature. Instead of cutting some well-needed costs, Chenard decides to bring his top executives on a walkabout. Returning to his 1968 roots, he brings his top 12 executives on a two-week trip to South America, to the windswept peaks of the real Patagonia. 
But instead of it being a wasteful endeavor, three key strategies were to emerge from this retreat. Solutions that would ultimately ensure the company's survival. One of Chenard's first solutions is to keep the company in Yarak. Yarak is a falconry term, which means that you must keep your falcon hungry, super alert, and ready to hunt at all times. Otherwise, the falcon will become lazy and unmotivated to hunt. And thus, one of his first responsibilities is to keep the company and his management team in equilibrium, to keep them in Yarak. But why falconry? Jannard's business insights are rooted in the outdoors and in climbing, and his climbing interests are in fact rooted in falconry. It's 1945. Chenard, at the age of seven, moves to California from a French-speaking village on the border of Canada in Maine. Unable to speak English, young Yvonne is a misfit from the start. Unable to make friends, he slowly gravitates towards the outdoors. And by the age of 14, he joins the Southern California Falconry Club, which trains hawks and falcons for hunting. And in order to access these falconeries, he must learn how to climb down cliff faces. And it's this ethos of the outdoors that Chenard brings to the company retreat and instills within his management team. Overexpansion had bloated the company and the team had lost its focus and precision. Patagonia needed to stay hungry. Chenard was and always has been a man of the land, and many of his beliefs are attributable to the countless hours he spent in the outdoors. And Chenard would again look to the land and to tradition for a second strategy, turning to the concept of the seventh generation. This is the flag of the Iroquois Nation, one of over 500 First Nations still active in the US today. The seventh generation is a concept within the Iroquois Nation, the Native American tribe from Northeast America, who when tasked with difficult decisions involving their community, shift their discussion to be heavily long-term in its focus. The idea is that one member of the tribe must represent an imagined member of a future seventh generation of the tribe. Namely, one member must be an ambassador or representative in the present for seven generations in the future. And Jannard was to draw heavily on this concept in his company's fight for survival. In fact, it's not the first time that Jannard has had to consider the long-term. During the rise of his equipment business two decades earlier, Chenard noticed that their pitons were permanently damaging the environment. And despite their popularity and profitability, Chenard decides to cease production of this top-selling product, vowing only to produce removable aluminium chocks. And just like the Iroquois nation, Chenard had to shift his perspective to that of a leader of a company 100 years into the future. This move would be the start of a cornerstone in the philosophy of Patagonia forever questioning whether a current product or policy is good for the environment in the long term. As Chenard would come to espouse, long-term values can guide quick decision-making every day, and in order to survive, the members of Patagonia had to think in the long term and ask themselves who they were and where they were going. As a third strategy, Chenard decides to instill a simple Zen philosophy to the business. Living within his means and living simply was something Chenard did from his earliest days, selling pitons out of the back of his rusty old car. And in a crisis moment like this, the group needed clarity and to ask themselves the hard but simple questions. And so Chenard would challenge his group by asking them, why are we in business? What are our values? What are we trying to do? And what kind of company do we want to be? And from the course of this debate, the shape and form of their values would slowly bubble up to the surface. And just like Chenard's first trip in 1968, great things were to emerge from this retreat to Patagonia. In fact, the impact started immediately. And on their return, Chenard and the executive group met with their board of directors. And no more than 60 minutes into the meeting, a board member named Jerry Mander took the key points raised and condensed them down to a two-page mission statement and company vision. A vision which for 1991 was, and still is, well ahead of its time. The result was the now famous mission statement that would guide the company out of inevitable bankruptcy and into continued success. Build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, and use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. 
With renewed vigor and focus, the company quickly sobered up. And within three years, they eliminated several layers of management, consolidated inventories into a single system, and brought the sales channels under central control. Patagonia was now equipped with a robust business philosophy and code of ethics that looked beyond profits and growth for growth's sake. The company was now going to look for sustainable paths to growth and focus on long-term vision over short-term gain. Yvonne Chouinard continues to blaze new trails, illustrated by his decision in 1996 to move at great cost all of Patagonia's clothing lines to 100% organic cotton. And since 1985, Patagonia has donated over $79 million to environmental causes, thus ensuring a long-term commitment to the environment and to its community. All of these endeavors stem from that one brazen moment when Chenard decided to ignore the naysayers, trust his instinct, and venture out into the unknown, down into the heart of Patagonia.